Hey everyone, welcome back to my round five recap video of the Gibraltar Battle of the Sexes tournament. In this game, I played none other than Grandmaster Maria Muzichuk from Ukraine. She is a former world women's champion, uh, one of the highest rated players playing in this event with a FIDE rating of 2539. And I believe she is number six in the world for women players. Uh, so I knew it was going to be a tough opponent, but uh, I came prepared and we walked into what started as an open Sicilian. And if you guessed from the title, I did play a, a surprise move here, which caught her perhaps a, a little bit off guard. Um, now the main move here by far, which has been played millions upon millions of times, is C takes D4 which enters the kind of main open Sicilian position where black has a lot of options. But a secondary move, which is uh, completely playable for black, is knight to f6. And I looked up the statistics uh, of this move and it's played in about three to 4% of, of games in the master's database. So uh, it's a playable move. And normally this move just transposes back into an open Sicilian after knight c3, takes, takes, and I was ready to go into this position. However, when I played knight f6, uh, Maria began thinking for, uh, for longer than expected. She took about, let's say, five to six minutes in this position and didn't play knight c3. Um, now, I'm not sure why, because if I took, took, and then played knight f6, Knight c3 is the most common move. It's possible that she wanted to go into something like f3, uh, which is one of the main reasons to play knight f6 in this position, is to avoid the f3 line. It's also possible she was preparing maybe queen takes d4, but uh, I didn't quite find out what her, her main preparation was in the event that I, if I took on d4. So after I played knight f6, she played a move which I knew is playable here, is, is bishop to b5 check. Um, definitely not the most common move. And uh, we ended up going into a variation which is very rare. Um, I'm checking the stats here. Uh, it's been played in, in just over 100 games. And after bishop d7, takes, takes. Uh, we traded pawns, takes. Knight takes e4, cd6, knight d6. This position has been reached 32 times in master level play. And one small tidbit. I did have this position on my computer screen the morning of uh, the day that this game was played. So it was part of my preparation, although I didn't prepare super extensively here. I just knew that the engine gives approximately equal and uh, it's very playable for both sides. So we continued here uh, following opening principles. She castled, I played knight c6, knight c3. And then I took a bit of a think because it's a question how black completes development. I was very tempted to castle queenside to try and make the game really sharp and exciting and then uh, eventually go for some kingside attack. But I concluded that's uh, it's very risky given that I don't have a c-pawn and white can develop very naturally with bishop to f4. So I was then thinking how to develop my dark sword bishop. And there's really two ways to do so. There's e6 and bishop e7, and there's g6 and bishop g7. And I decided to go for kind of the more dragon style, put the bishop along the long diagonal. And the reason why I didn't play g6 first in this position is it walks into queen d4. So it's important to play knight c6 first, control d4, and then play pawn g6. And here we continue, bishop f4, bishop g7, Queen e2, so a uh, very natural move, uh, getting ready to play rook d1 and pressure my knight on d6. I went ahead and castled here, and then she played rook a d1. So at first glance, it looks to be a little bit awkward for black because my knight on d6 is pinned, it's attacked twice, and uh, my queen is just aligned with the white rook. So in an attempt to resolve the issues, I played the move queen f5, which I think is one of the strongest moves. It uh, gets off the d file and hits the bishop, puts the queen on a very active square, also pressures the c pawn. 
And I wasn't really worried about white winning a pawn here. Uh, queen f5 is a, a pawn sacrifice, allowing bishop takes d6, takes d6, and rook takes d6. But uh, I thought I would have at least a few options here. Maybe the simplest is bishop takes c3, b takes c3, and uh, move like queen a5, hitting this and this. And I spent a bit of time calculating this and thought I should be completely fine here after queen c4, rook c8, and the extra pawn for white isn't too meaningful. So she didn't take on d6. Instead, she played knight to d5, which is a, a very confrontational move, of course, targeting e7 and making it so I can't play rook e8 because then there's knight c7 with a fork. So uh, the center was beginning to get quite messy just with all the minor pieces in the position having influence on the various squares. I could draw more arrows here, but uh, might as well show the next move I played, pawn e5, uh, creating even more kind of chaos in the center. I'm now attacking the bishop, but I'm leaving my knight and undefended. And in some sense, I am subjecting myself to tactics. And I will admit here, I kind of overlooked her next move. Now, I was aware that, okay, white has some tactical ideas, but I didn't quite realize that her next move actually works tactically. She played the move knight takes e5. And uh, this is where things get really messy, um, but it's also the beginning of things simplifying. So the point of knight takes e5 is that this knight on c6 is tied down to defending e7. If I take on e5 too soon with the knight, then I get forked and oh no, my queen. Um, so after she took on e5, I took with my bishop. And here it looks like if white takes on e5 with the bishop, then I can play rook e8. And even though I'm down a pawn temporarily, white is a little bit struggling with this pinned bishop on e5. And a move like knight f6 doesn't quite work because queen takes f6 and there's a pin and after takes, takes, takes. I win c2, this should be fine for uh, for black, I believe. Um, so instead of going into that, she played a move that I only realized after she took on e5, after bishop takes e5, she doesn't need to take with the bishop, she can actually take with the queen. And this is a very easy move to overlook because it just looks impossible my knight is hitting the queen. But the point is if I take the queen, then she forks me. And this is a very good transformation for white. If I play king g7, takes, 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 uh, things simplify. I'm just down upon here. Black is much worse. So didn't go into that. After she played queen takes e5, I just took back with my queen. And this is a slightly better version for black because after takes, takes, White does win back the piece after knight to e7, king g7, and rook takes e6. And all of this happened in the game. So ton of trades, uh, the chaos has settled a little bit. But we get into a position where I have compensation for the pawn uh, for a few reasons. First of all, this knight on e7 is a bit exploitable. And also the pawns on the queen side are potential targets. I have ideas of knight c4 to hit the rook and the pawn. Um, but here I decided to start with the move rook f to d8. It's possible that I had a, a better option. Perhaps rook a d8 was a bit, uh, bit more precise to keep the option open of rook f e8. But the point of rook f d8 here is that I want to get a situation where if she takes, I would take back and the knight is trapped on e7. And I think black would be very close to winning here after king f6. And white would have to, um, to be very, very careful not to lose the knight on e7. So instead of playing rook takes d8, she played the move rook d to d1. And now it's up to me to try and prove some compensation for still being down a pawn. And I grabbed the initiative, played knight c4, hitting the pawn on b2. She played b3, and then I bring my knight back to b6. So at first, maybe it looks like I lost a bit of time moving my knight twice, but the point is now I'm controlling the d5 square, which is really the only getaway for the knight on e7. 
And in order for White to resolve the problem of the knight, she has to go for the idea of c4 and knight d5, uh, which happened. c4 was played, king f6, and knight d5 check. And then the nice thing for me is that after takes, takes, the pawn on d5 is... It is an extra pawn for white, but it's also a very clear weakness in the position. And I have a simple plan of getting my rooks to the d file, playing king e5, and trying to target the pawn. Um, now, not exactly this happened, as we're going to see, but uh, I thought we were reaching a position that should be very close to equal, because extra pawn I didn't think is, is so strong for white. However, the game does continue, and we're going to see there is very much a, a fight left to be played. I started with rook to d7. The reason for rook d7 and not rook d6 is to preserve the d6 square for my king, which could be relevant in some lines. There's other lines where I want to just have the rook defending my pawns on the 7th in case white goes for some eventual counterplay. And here she played rook to d4. I responded with rook to c8. I did consider rook a to d8, but uh, I thought that after rook d1, if I try and attack the pawn here, threatening rook takes d5, she has annoying move f4, and then my king would either just have to move back to f6, or move to d6, where it prevents my rooks from attacking the pawn. So even though I can attack the d pawn a few times, it's really hard to win. And I figured that I might as well just control an open file, try and get my rook to c2. She played rook fd1, I brought my rook to c2, and she played the very simple move a4, so keeping the pawn defended. I played king e5 now. She played g3, I played king d6, and I was still feeling very fine here. Um, again, even though I'm down a pawn, I didn't quite see how white makes meaningful progress. But as we're gonna see, she uh, she was very resourceful in the position and found some interesting ideas to keep the game going. She played the move rook one to d3, played rook e7, ideas of eventually targeting the second rank, maybe even going for rook e5 and rook c5 to get a situation where I have three clean attackers against a d5 pawn. But then she played a move which I think is very strong. It's pawn to g4. And turns out white does have a pretty clear plan in this position. It's to swing over the rook from d3 to h3 and attack the pawn on h7, which can be a very clear weakness. On top of that, she might also want to play g5 and just use one pawn to fix three pawns on the king side. Uh, so g4 is a really nice positional move for white, and I was beginning to sense that the position isn't so simple, and I still have to play accurately to hold on. I went ahead here and played rook to e5, which is a multi-purpose move. It uh, pressures the d5 pawn, but also supports either f5 or h5 in the event that the rook comes to one of these files. Uh, so she played rook f4 here, and I responded with f5. So here we're going to see some trades. Uh, she took, took, takes, and takes. I thought the more trades that happen, especially the trades of pawns, the closer it would be to just drawing the game. So uh, I, I was okay with this transformation. And here she played king to g2. And then I realized, uh-oh, I have to be careful because if I allow the king to come too far in, then... I might just be losing, um, especially if the king comes f4, then f5 is a big weakness. And I don't really have time for rook c5. Uh, this is a move, of course, I want to play right away just to win the d5 pawn. The problem here is white's king activates really quickly. Oh, I can play king g3, and I can't get away with taking on d5 because after takes, takes, this is a winning king pawn ending for white simply because white's king gets too active after king f4, king e6, king g5, uh, white's going to win the h-pawn and eventually win the game here. So I was well aware of that. And in a position like this, especially a, a rook ending, uh, the concept of prophylactic play 
is really, really important. And for those of you that don't know what prophylactic means, it just means preventive play. So the thought process for me in this position is to ask myself, what does white want to do and how do I stop it? So it's very clear white wants to activate the king. And once we know that, the answer to the second question is actually pretty simple. Uh, I want to get my rook to e4. If I get my rook to e4, it cuts off the king, prevents any annoying counterplay from white. I play rook e2 here, which I think is the strongest move, so that if king f3, rook e4, and it would be very difficult for white to make progress from here, given that the king is completely boxed out of the position, and white's rook is also tied down to the pawn. So we didn't enter that line. Uh, instead of king f3, she played the move rook to h3, which I was actually happy to see, because after rook h3, it's a signal that we're going to be trading more pawns. I started with a move rook to b2, um, now pressuring b3, and also creating a situation where she can't move her king to the third rank, because then I take with check and even get a winning position. So she took on h7. I took on b3, winning back the pawn and defending my b7 pawn. She played rook f7, and I played rook to b4. And she played a5 here, so saving the a pawn. I played rook b5, and here she played h4. And now it's clear that white has uh, just an easy idea to push the h pawn and make a queen. And I do have a decision to make which pawn to take. Ultimately, I decided to take on d5 here. The point being is that if she takes on b7, I would take on a5, and this should be a uh, pretty easy draw, given that I defend a pawn, and it's king rook in two against king rook in two. H pawn doesn't scare me. But uh, instead of white taking on b7, she continued to push the h pawn. And here I do have to be careful, because h pawn is just three moves away from queening, and uh, don't want to allow white any like weird promotion tricks or tactics or anything like that. So I decided to play the move f4, which looks very logical. It attacks the pawn, opens the fifth rank. Here I'm just trying to simplify as much as possible. Um, she continued here with h6, and then I took on a5. So pawns are continuing to come off the board. She took on b7, and this is where we reach a critical moment. Uh, rook takes b7 was move 41, so we each got an additional half hour on the clock. I had a lot of time to think here, and I did take a lot of time. I probably spent 15 minutes on my next move, um, just because we're so deep into the endgame. It's clear white is still the one playing for a win, I mean, the pawn is dangerous, white has ideas of king f3 to win the pawn, so I have to be really, really careful here. And when I played my next move, I thought I had calculated everything, and I'll go ahead and show, I played the move rook to h5. Uh, my idea was that I would just put my rook on h4, abandoning my a7 pawn, and I thought the rook on h4 would just hold the whole king side together, it would keep an eye on h6, it would prevent the king from doing any damage because my f pawn would always be defended, and then I would have a very simple plan of bring my king in. And I didn't think white would have any chances of winning this position just because things are so, so simplified. So we reached this position. I had about 15-ish minutes left on my clock. Uh, she took on a7. I confidently played rook to h4, and this is where, to my horror, she played a move which I had completely overlooked. This is a, the second kind of big surprise of the game. I managed to surprise her on move 3, but she surprised me on move 43, and for some reason her next move completely escaped me, and when she played it, I very quickly knew that I was in some trouble. So here comes a time, if you're watching this and you want more time to think, feel free to pause the video and find the best move for white. I will say it is white to move and find the only winning move. 
it does bring me some pain to look back at this position, but it's also just a really instructive moment and shows perhaps one of the differences between an international master and a grandmaster like Maria, um, who's able to find these resources very late into the game where perhaps we're both a bit tired, exhausted from playing for several hours. But uh, as we see, her, her endgame technique was incredibly sharp. And the move she played here is rook to a3. It took a moment for things to sink in. But uh, yeah, black is now in big, big trouble because white has a threat of rook h3. And I can't take the pawn immediately because rook a6 check would then win my rook. And the problem here is my king is just a little bit too far away uh, from just saving the position. I really want to play king e6 here. The problem is after rook h3, if we trade rooks, I could win the h-pawn, but white can win the g-pawn, and this would just be a losing king-pawn ending with white's king well in front of the, the past f-pawn. So didn't go into that. Again, I took my time here and was trying to find any possible resource to put up resistance. And I was really calculating every option imaginable. And the move I ended up playing here is f3 check. It's a tricky move. It's an attempt to bait either the king or the rook to take my pawn. Um, if rook takes pawn, then I can take on h6. This would be a draw. And if king takes pawn, then rook h3, and I win the rook. So white definitely doesn't want to do that. Um, unfortunately, after I play f3, she doesn't take the pawn. She plays king g3. Very strong move. Hitting my rook. Again, laughing at the fact I can't take the pawn because rook a6. So I put my rook on h1. And now she plays a move which uses the same idea as earlier when we saw rook a3 the whole idea was to get behind the pawn here she plays rook to a4 which i'll admit i didn't see coming but it makes so much sense in the position and of course she saw rook a4 and she likes it because the rook now wants to come to h4 and uh, i have all the same problems as before but this time my f3 pawn is definitely going to fall so i play rook g1 she took, I play rook h1. I was really trying to create a situation where I'll have a chance to bring my king to h8. What just happened there? Unexpected code. Let's cancel that. <laughs> um, unfortunately, the, uh, the teleportation doesn't exist yet. My king can't teleport to h8. Um, she played king g3, threatening rook h4 again. I was annoyed. I check. Now she plays king h2. And here my rook can no longer defend from behind. It has to go in front of the pawn. And after h7, rook h8, rook h4, white achieves the basically dream position where my rook is completely, completely stuck. If I ever move it, white will queen. Now the only piece left that can move is my king. And we're gonna see me get into Zugzwang very, very quickly. After I move my king in, she uh, delivers check on h5. I play king g6 and she plays king to g4. Now I did have one really hopeful trick in the position that uh, after I played the move king f6, I was really hoping she would play f4, king g6, f5, king f6. And if white's not careful here and plays a move king f4, thinking that black's just in Zuzwang, it looks like my king has to move back, white will move forward. Uh, turns out there is one saving move here for black. And this is another great kind of puzzle moment. If you don't see the move for black, feel free to pause the video. It is black to move and draw, the move being rook takes h7. And uh, there is a really nice stalemate potential in, uh, in this position. Of course, she did not even give me the chance to, to set that up. And instead of playing f4, she played rook to h6, just forcing my king back to the seventh rank. And after king g7, I keep having to move my king. 
She plays rook h4, move my king. She did a little bit of time wasting, but uh, white can kind of just torture me here because I, I only can move my king. And once I play king f7, she brought her king to h6. And now that white's king defends a pawn, white's rook can start hurting me and come even more alive. After I play rook a8, she played rook f3, king e6, king g7, I gave one more check, king g8, and here I threw in the towel and resigned. So this was a very heartbreaking game, especially because I thought the game was just heading towards a draw out of the simplification in the middle game. But here we saw the persistence of a very strong grandmaster in Maria Muzichuk, and uh, all it took was one blunder for me to lose a game. If we go back to the critical moment, the only drawing move here was king e6, which looks very logical, an attempt to just walk towards the pawn. Now, it still would have been tricky, and even though uh, it's easy to just look at the engine and think this is an easy draw, after king to f3, uh, I still need to be really, really precise. Turns out there's only one drawing move, again for black in this position, which is rook to h2. So I will say, after this tournament is over, I'm going to have to study this endgame a lot more extensively, um, and just endgames in general, too. It's so, so important to, um, to minimize mistakes late in the endgame, because one mistake in the whole game can be over. And this game was especially painful because I spent over four hours fighting, holding on against a very strong player, and uh, I still lost, and it was all due to... Uh, um, to a blunder very late in the game, but that's one of the lessons in chess, and hopefully I can come back stronger, and hopefully this will make me a better player. So that about does it for the recap. I hope you guys enjoyed it, hope you learned a thing or two, and now it's time for me to sleep and also prepare. Uh, I'm recording this on the rest day. Tomorrow's round six, and I'll be playing against another strong player, Marie Sabag from France. So stay tuned for more videos and I will catch you in the next one.